Um, tonight, uh, like I mentioned, is in part nine. We got one more session, which is next week. But what has been good, giving us a lot of information. And I've been giving you all a lot of information. I hope it wasn't too much information. But I think it's sufficient for you to, in your own time, to actually read it through. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about um, heaven, the, or the way to heaven. We talked about heaven. We talked about where, what heaven is, which is a place. We talked about where heaven is and is up, remember? We talked about what heaven is like, which is glorious, beautiful. It has the throne of God, the temple of God, and the new Jerusalem. And what will we be like? We talked about having perfect bodies and souls. And how will we relate to one another, to angels, to family, and to other believers? And how do we relate to God? And we've talked about fellowship with God, our vision of God, which, will, which means we will see him. And then what we will do. And we talked about that last week. One of the negative part of it, we will not sin. We will not sin no more. We will worship, we will reign, we will serve, we will rest, and we'll be served. And so those are the things that we've talked about so far. Was that nine? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's seven. But I think we kind of, we missed one. I, I don't know. I don't know if I missed one, but then you can let me know which one I miss. All right? But also, too, while I was in Eleuthera this past weekend, um, it was a good time. Um, Miss Puss sang her first solo. They had, a, they had to come in and sing, and she sang, and, um, and I spoke, and so that was good. A very small church, but the Lord has blessed them in their ministry. Uh, and in my conversations with Brother Gar Thompson, which is Michael Thompson's father, um, he said, uh, Pastor Dave, you know that verse, that verse that you quote? I have not seen and ear have not heard what the Lord, um, let me read it for you. I have not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. He said, do you know that that doesn't really apply to heaven? <laughs> I say, oh. I said, okay, so both of us went on our phones and we you know, checked it out. <laughs> and um, then I saw he showed me a commentary. He pulled out a, uh, what do you call it? Um, an actual physical copy of the commentary. And he showed me, and I said, oh, wow. I said, okay, I'll think about that. And I said, what I'll do is I'll go home, and I'll search this, and when I get back, I'll mention it on Wednesday. The verse primarily doesn't really refer to heaven. It refers to the mysteries of God that God revealed to us through his spirit. And that's from 1 Corinthians 2, 6 to 16. That's that whole section together. And one of the authors, he actually said this, which I thought was pretty good. He says, as you know, it's like so many verses we memorize, we memorize them out of context. Right? We memorize them out of context. And so when he says when he was little, he can remember learning that verse that was referring to heaven. But that verse actually does not really refer to heaven primarily, but it refers to um, us having the mis Paul giving us the mystery of God, which is revealed by the Spirit, because I have not seen nor ear have ever heard what God has planned for his people. And so that, you can look at the context of that in Second, 1 Corinthians 2, 6 through 16. So I say, oh, I'll, I'll look it up. It was refreshing to see. And it was good to know that other people are listening. <laughs> y'all listening? You know, I, I think y'all are listening and y'all are checking it out. And that's great. That's good. Don't just take your word for it. Correct. That's right. And he's checking it home. Right. Milton? Okay. Well, you know, as a minister, sometimes when you are speaking, when you see somebody approach you and say, I want to talk to you about something, you always sit back and you cringe because you say, I don't know what they're going to ask you, you know. 
And sometimes they don't agree with you. Um, so then you'll have to kind of take that in, you know, with, a, with a bucket of salt instead of a green because you have to deal with that. But I was glad to know that he was listening. Um, and even those who are part of the assembly, they're kind of connected because even when they introduce, was introducing me, they were saying, um, so, so Pastor Dave, you could be in heaven part nine coming this week. I said, I said these people listen. <laughs> so, so they are connected. Um, so we're grateful for that. But tonight what we're going to be talking about here is the way to heaven. Now, I was going to go ahead. I, you all remember this study that Pastor Gill did a couple, uh, about a year or so back? Christianity, cults, and religions. I don't know if you all remember this one. Christian, yeah. And so I was, I was, I was going to take some, of, some information from this to say let's just find out what other people believe and what we really believe in terms of which way to heaven. Um, one of the things that they really, really, um, when they compare the, this um, Christianity, which is our Bible, to other faiths, which is uh, like Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and Seventh-day Adventists and so forth, one of the questions you have to ask is, what do they think about Jesus? And I'll just read a few. Um, in this Jehovah's Witness, it says, Jesus is not God, but he lived on earth. He was, he was Michael the archangel, Jehovah made the universe through him. On earth he was a man who lived a perfect life. After dying on a stake, not a cross, he was resurrected as a spirit and his body was destroyed. Jesus is not coming again. He returned invisibly in 1914 in spirit. Very soon he and the angels will destroy all, Je all non-Jehovah witnesses. I said, well, yeah, we're all going to die, guys. We're all going to die. Then the Mormons, they say Jesus is, a, Jesus is a separate God from the Father. He was created as a spirit child by the Father and Mother in heaven. There's a Father and Mother in heaven, okay? And is the elder brother of all men and, spirits be, and spirit beings, including Lucifer. His body was created through sexual union between Elohim and Mary. Jesus was married. His death on the cross does not provide full atonement for all sin, but does provide everyone with resurrection. <laughs> well, this is what they believe. Okay. <sighs> I like this one. Um, no, I did not like this one. Sorry, I, that's not the right word to use. Um, this is from Nation of Islam, you know, the, um, I think the black, black, black Islamics. He says, officially Jesus is a sinless prophet of Allah. Privately, Jesus was born from adultery between Mary and Joseph, who was already married to another woman. Jesus was not crucified, but stabbed in the heart, in the heart by a police officer. I said, police officer? They didn't have a police officer in the days. He is still buried in Jerusalem. Prophecies of Jesus' return to, to Master Far, Elijah Muhammad, or to Louis Farrakhan. And so this is what people believe about Jesus. Now, when you think about how do you get to heaven? What is the way to heaven? Is there a way to heaven? And then there's other, other people, um, even within Christianity um, or Christendom, they would actually say that you can actually get through heaven through another person, which is like Mary. You know, Mary, she is the co redemptress or she is the co um, mediate so that she, along with Jesus, provides way to heaven. So in one sense, there's a lot of stuff going on there talking how to get to heaven. But tonight, we're going to be looking at two verses. And those two verses we're going to expound on, because this writer really expounded on them. And I think we all would agree with the, with the conclusion of it. But what he did was he broke it down very simply for all of us to understand. He's going to be talking in twos. He's going to be saying two of this, two of this, two of this. And what, who is he quoting from? Jesus himself. Okay? Now, what did Jesus say about himself? Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The question you have to ask is, was Jesus telling the truth? Or was Jesus a liar? Those are the only two options you have. Is he telling the truth or is he lying? So, he, he says to Thomas, and very interesting, Thomas, of all people who we call Doubting Thomas, he asks the question. He says, Lord, 
Where are you going? We don't know the way. And then that's when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says this, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. This is not in your notes, all right? So you're looking at your notes for it? It's not in your notes. I'm just kind of just introducing it as we get into it. Because when we get into it, we can go into Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. So we're going now with this assumption. The assumption is that Jesus is the way. We would all agree with that because we're, we're all believers in Jesus Christ. You know, we're all believers in Jesus Christ. We may not be like the others who have a part of these uh, other forms of religion, but we are believers in Christ. So we can get right into it. Now, I'm not sure if we'll complete all of this tonight. It has nine pages, um, but the idea would be it should be a little bit simplistic. You all got nine pages, right? Now, y'all don't go to the back yet. Y'all count the pages, eh? Y'all like them people who's be watching the clock, eh? Y'all, when y'all get the page nine, it's like, oh, you're almost finished. <laughs> Actually, I'm watching the clock. I'm watching the clock. I'll tell you, you know. <laughs> all right, so it's the page number nine. In Matthew, the introduction as we start, in Matthew chapter seven, the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus began in chapter five comes to a great climax. That climax is stated in verses 13 and 14. And the remainder of the sermon in chapter, 11, chapter 7 is simply an expansion of those two verses. Because we'll talk about it a little later in the same lesson, that he expands it. He goes into these things of two. He says this, Enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be who go in that way. Because narrow is the gate, and hard is the way, which lead it unto life, and few there be that find it. So we see here, how many gates do we have? Two gates, the narrow and the wide. And so this is what we'll be talking about in this time tonight. There's only two ways to heaven. Actually, no, I shouldn't say that. There is, yeah. I don't want to jump the gun because I want to bring the point. No, I'm not going to jump the point. Let's go. The choice. There is a pro, pro, that is a provocative statement for, by our Lord. It is the point that he was emphasizing in the first part of his masterful sermon. He brings the whole sermon to the climax of a decision. In verses 13 and 14, he talks about two gates that bring an individual to two roads that leads to two destinations populated by two different, crowd, different crowds. And the Lord focuses on the inevitable decision that has to be made regarding what he had already spoken about in the Sermon of the Mount. Someone appropriately had said that all of life concentrates on man at the crossroads. From the time we are old enough to make the independent decisions, life becomes a matter of constant decision making. Every day of our lives, we make decisions about all kinds of things. We decide what time we, we, we will get up. You all do that? You all decide what time you all get up? Or you all set the alarm for it? <laughs> do you all get up when the alarm go off? Or you turn right to it and just touch that alarm until I can get another 15 minutes. We decide what we will eat, where we will go, what we will do. We choose roads all the way through life. So it is fair to say that life consists of, of man at the crossroads. Ultimately and inevitably, there is a final choice you must make about where you spend eternity. And so we're, we're looking at that. So Jesus is bringing the issue home. In one sense, he's forcing the issue. The Sermon of the Mount that he spoke in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is not a grander sermon and everybody could say, ah, oh. and the result of that sermon uh, is, is stated in the end of chapter 7. They said, this man speaks with authority. You know, he didn't speak like the other rabbis. They were astonished by his speaking. Jesus didn't want to impress nobody. He was speaking a message, and he wanted people to respond to the message. And then he comes to this point, and he wants them to make choices. So God has already made the effort to bring men to making that ultimate choice. There is always an opinion, so there is always a choice. The ultimate choice is what God is most concerned about. And we're going to look at a few examples. For example, God has offered that choice through Moses. God confronted the children of Israel through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 30. He said this, 
I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Because, you know, he came right out of those chapters in chapter 28 and 29, and they would stand on, I think six tribes stood on this mountain, the other six stood on this, on the other mountain, and they would read off the curses. If you say, um, cursed are you if you do this. Cursed are you if you do this. Cursed are you. And then everybody said, amen. And then he says, blessed of you if you do this. Blessed of you if you do this. And after he finished all that, then they said, amen. Then the Lord says, I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. And if you and your seed do it, you have to make the choice. God's not going to force anyone to make that choice. God gave to the people of Israel the ultimate choice, life or good or death and evil. If they obeyed, they were blessed. If they disobeyed, they were cursed. And that was what was operating in that particular section. He called them to make a decision for one or the other. Now, you remember this, this, remember this one, Joshua? Through Joshua, whom the people had followed into the promised land after Moses, the Israelites were given a choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served. Then he said, but as for me and my house, we will what? We will serve the Lord. So that was the choice. So Jeremy, um, Joshua, coming to the end of his life, He's saying to the children of Israel, listen, um, choose you this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about Jeremiah? God told Jeremiah to say unto, these, unto this people, thou shalt say, thus says the Lord, behold, I have set before you the way of life and the way of death. And so God has given choices. Elijah, when Elijah was on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings 18, 21, he called for the Israelites to make a decision. Elijah says, how long how halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The ultimate choice is in view here. So you see from Moses and Joshua and Jeremiah, and you also see with Elijah, you begin to see them offering the choices to people, life and death. Blessing and cursing. God or Baal. You know. Then Jesus. In John chapter 6 we read that many people follow Jesus. And call themselves his disciples. As implied in verses 60 to 61. But in verse 66. We read that many of them turned their backs on him. And no longer followed him. And in verses 67 to 68 says. Then said Jesus unto the twelve. Will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. Peter articulated his, Peter articulated his choice. So we see the choices, Old Testament as well as New Testament. And we see here now that even in one sense, we see Jesus is now going to give men two choices. Jesus is the crux of every man's destiny. The choice is made at the crossroads of Christ. Choose life or choose what? Death. Essentially, that is what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. The choice is clear cut. There are only two choices. The narrow way or the wide way. There are no other alternatives. You're, all of us are on either one of those ways. We're either on the way that is narrow or we're on the way that is broad. And I think for most of us in this room, we are on, or all of us are on the, that's, that's safe to say by the end, eh? Yes, safe to say that. <laughs> because why? We put our faith in the way, which is Jesus Christ. Now, what's the contrast? The contrast here, and according to this writer, in which I, I agree, he says the contrast here is not between religion and paganism or uh, religion, Christianity, and cults. It's not like we're trying to compare ourselves with the nation of Islam or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness. But this is, this is where um, you're talking about Christianity in Christendom. It seems to be two ways. Many people have interpreted Matthew 7, 13 to 14 that way. They say that the narrow way is the way of Christianity, which goes to heaven, and that the broad way goes to hell. 
However, Jesus is not contrasting Christianity openly in moral masses that are merely on their way to hell. He is contrasting two kinds of religion. And I'll read this one. This is important. Both roads are marked. This is the way to heaven. So it's not like you have uh, two signs up. Can you imagine you had two signs up? This is the way to heaven. And this is the way to hell. Which way do you think everybody would go? They would go that way. But if you have two, way, or two of the ways mark the same thing, you see where the deception lies, right? One is the way, the true way, but one is a way of deception. And that's the one that leads them down a path of destruction. And so Jesus is saying, you know, um, you got to be careful. So that wouldn't be very, sorry, this is, I said it earlier, Satan doesn't mark the broad way, this is the way to hell. That wouldn't be very deceptive. We are not looking at a contrast between righteousness and obvious unrighteousness, but between divine righteousness and human righteousness. And Matthew 7, 13 to 14 compares true divine religion to false human religion. And that sets into the context. Who is Jesus talking to? He's speaking to who? Which, which group of people? The Jews. And then he's speaking in contrast also to the religious form that they had, which was Judaism, and he's speaking really out against that. Because actually he said in, in the Sermon of the Mount, he says, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom. So that means that he's comparing now between not religious and pagan, but he's talking about people who look like believers. Because the Pharisees, these guys, they tithe, they tithe, they fast probably three times a week. They said it in their own, in their discourse with Jesus. So they appear to be righteous. But then Jesus is saying, you know, it's deception. Jesus wants to bring man to a point where he realizes that in his flesh, he's utterly incapable of pleasing God. He wants man to be in, de in desperation with a broken spirit, meek and mournful, crying out for righteousness from God. Because how does he start his sermon? Anybody remember how he starts his sermon, the Sermon of the Mount? What's the first words? Blessed are the what? Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Remember all those ones? Remember those? That's how he starts it. He wanted them to understand that you, on, on your own, you have no righteousness whether not you can claim to say you can stand before God on. You have to be poor in spirit. You have to mourn over your sin. You want a thirst and hunger for righteousness. And so he's beginning to develop his, his, his sermon. The Jewish leaders thought that they were on their way to heaven. But Jesus forced them to reconsider and make a decision. Because he had a very interesting discussion with them in John 8. You know, he actually called them, you are of your father, the devil. Remember that? Because <laughs> for, for you to say that to a Pharisee, that's very, very hurtful. Because he believes that he is on his way to heaven. He's a descendant of Abraham. He is circumcised on the eighth day. He is religious. He fasts three times a week. Or he gives tenth of everything that he has. He is righteous and religious in his own eyes. But his righteousness can't get him to God. And so Jesus would say, if you were of God, you would know me. But you're not of God, so you don't know me. So we begin to see the difference there. Every one of us has, has to make that decision. There are two gates, the wide and the narrow. There are two ways, the broad and the narrow. There are two destinations, life and destruction. There are two groups of travelers, the few and the many. And in the rest of Matthew 7, we all know this chapter, in the rest of Matthew 7, we see more contrasts. In verses 16 to 20, there are two kinds of trees and the good and the corrupt. There are two kinds of fruit, the good and the bad. And in verse 24 and 20 to 27 it says, there are two builders, the wise and the foolish. And there are two foundations, the rock and the sand. And there are also two houses. Remember those two houses? You build your house upon, we sing that song in Sunday school, remember? Build your house upon the sand. 
And then the other one builds his house upon the rock. Then there are two storms, two elements of the storm. The rain came down and caused the one that was on the sand to be destroyed. The other one, what? Stood his ground because it was built on rock. So Jesus is doing twos. He says there's two gates, two ways, two end of this life and destruction. And he goes in twos because he's forcing them to think through and to make a decision. Because you could be to the point where you say, okay, I believe I get into heaven. Y'all believe y'all get into heaven, right? See, y'all ain't sure about that. Y'all are very quiet on that. Um, John writes in his, in his, not in his gospel, but John writes in his epistle. John would say, I write this that you may what? Know that you have eternal life. So it's not a guessing thing. You know, it's something that we need to know. You, have, you can ask yourself, um, you're on the wide or the narrow? You're on the broad or on the narrow? You're going to life or you're going to destruction? Are you the few or the many? What kind of tree are you? The good and the, or the corrupt? Two kinds of fruit, the good and the bad. And so it just goes on with the two, the two, the two, the two, the two. So a clear-cut decision is the issue at the climax of the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus does not want bouquets for his ethics. He does not want people to pro postpone applying the requirements. He wants the pe a pe respond from people. He forces them to make a decision. Because you know, throughout his life, people would follow Jesus and says, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to follow you. I want to follow you. Then Jesus says, if you want to follow me, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and come follow me. Then one guy said, I, I won't follow you, but I won't bury my father first. Then Jesus made a comment about him. And remember the rich young ruler, he came, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus says to him, not in every case for everybody, but for this guy, Jesus nails it on the point. He says, go and sell all what you have. Boy, that hurt him, you know. And what did he do? He turned and he walked away. Choices. Choices. You can't sit back and not make a choice of Jesus. Jesus is not suggesting to you, I am the way, the truth and the life. He's telling you, I am the way. Because he, he said it earlier in, the, in the, first, the couple of verses before. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, but I go to what? Prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be what? Be also. Is Jesus lying? You have to ask yourself that. I mean, if he is lying, someone says that he can actually be a lunatic, because he's believing what he's saying. But how do we know that Jesus is true? What proves that with the words that Jesus said prove that he was indeed who he was? The resurrection. The resurrection proved that he was indeed who he said he was. So they trusted by faith on what he said. So there are two gates. In verse 13, Jesus said, Enter into the narrow gate, for wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction. And in verse 14, he says, The narrow is the gate which leadeth unto life. He mentions the narrow gate twice and the wide gate once. And there are only two gates. Both roads say they point to salvation and God. Both of them say they point to the kingdom, glory, and blessing. Both gates say they point to heaven, but only one goes there. And I think this is very important because when we think about getting to heaven, we need to know what is the right way. We need to know. We can't be guessing, you know. Um, so, he says, one road is the root of self-righteousness. We talked about earlier. The other is the way of divine righteousness. And Paul develops that whole theme in Romans. Before you get on the road, you have to go through one of the gates. You have to go through one of the gates. There's only two gates. But you're going through one of them. Okay? Let's talk about the narrow gate. The first thing you have to think about the narrow gate as we look in this 13, verse 13, it says, you must enter, right? In order for you to get through the gate, you must go in, right? So he says, Jesus said in verse 13, enter in at the narrow gate. 
There is a sense of urgency here in this um, aorist. Say it again. Aorist imperative. Okay. It demands action right away. Enter now. That's how Jesus is saying this. He says, enter now into the narrow gate. This is the time to enter. That is what God is calling us for. You must do that. It's not an option. It is a command. And the Lord Jesus has been teaching the Jewish listeners about a very narrow way of life. Their way of life tolerated sin. They had all kinds of laws and standards beyond those of God. They had invented a man-made system. He had presented a very confined approach to living in the, God, in the glory of God. His audience understood what he was talking about, a narrow prescribed way. According to the end of the chapter, Jesus taught them as one having authority, and he didn't merely quote all the teachings of the Jewish rabbis. He explains the specifics of God's law. And remember now, the, the Christianity in the early days was called the way. When was Christians first called Christians? In Antioch, and that was during what, whose time? Paul's time, remember that? So what were they calling the people from the time Jesus was crucified, resurrected, ascended, until Paul, when he went to Antioch in Syria? And he was there for a period of time, and then they say they were first called Christians in Antioch. Paul would act, they, they would call the people of the way, the way because they referred it to Jesus. And it's a very narrow way. Let me ask this, this is not a part of our notes, but is Christianity a narrow way? Huh? Is Christianity a narrow way? Okay, think on that, think on that. Compared to the Judaistic system, Jesus' way was very narrow. He said that they must enter the narrow way if they wanted to be in his kingdom. He demanded immediate action. He gave an absolute command without an alternative. It's not enough to listen to the preaching about the gate or to admire the ethics Jesus taught. You've got to enter the gate. You've got to go through the gate. And if you don't go through the gate and the gate is narrow or the gate is wide, you choose the gate. Jesus said that you cannot enter the kingdom unless you come to on the terms he describes. You all understand that? You can't come through this way, which is the narrow way, unless you come through it the way that Jesus described that you come through it. And we're going to look at some of that in a few minutes. Look at what he said. You must see yourself as a beggar in spirit. That means poor in spirit, Matthew 5, 3. Mourning over your sin, verse 4. Meek before a holy God, verse 5. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness, verse 6 of Matthew 5. You have to enter on his terms. Hell will be full of people that admire the Sermon of the Mount, but they didn't enter through the narrow gate. So we have to enter. We, and, and I think this is where we are. There is a, a form of what they call easy believism. I don't know, have you ever heard the word easy believism? Have you ever heard it before? Milton, you've heard it before. Ken, I think you should hear it before, right? The idea is that all you have, and I'm going to read about a few things. People just believe in Jesus, and then they live their life, and they do whatever they want to do, and if they die in their sin, they go into heaven anyhow. In one form, when you look at the words that Jesus spoke in the New Testament, Jesus is saying some very narrow, narrow things. When he said, when the people said they will follow him, he says, if you won't follow me, deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Then come follow me. He, he wasn't pulling no punches with that. It was a, a reality check for a lot of people. Not only when we must enter the narrow gate, it says, sorry, we must enter the narrow gate. Jesus said that, it, that there is a wide gate, a wide one, but he doesn't tell you to enter it because it leads to destruction. He wants you to enter through the narrow gate, but not the wide gate. If you're going to be in the kingdom, you have to go through the narrow gate. You just can't admire it. 
and, to the, and the gate to the kingdom is very narrow. People say Christianity doesn't leave room for anyone else's view of salvation. And that is exactly right. It is not because Christians are selfish or egotistical. God has only given one way for man to be saved. You all understand that? It ain't like we as Christians came up with this thing that we say, you know something, you have to believe in Jesus, it's the only way to go to heaven. Then we, they look at you and say, there is no way. I remember that uh, time when Oprah, Oprah Whitney had that one, and they were saying, the one person, he said, Jesus is the only way. And she said, it, is, it cannot be. Jesus cannot be the only way. Because we have other ways. But no. Are we being egotistical? Are we being foolish? We didn't say it. Who said that? God. And see the verses that here? Acts 14, Acts 4, 12, we read, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That's not us. Then it says, Jesus said, I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. He says in John 4, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John 10, he said that he is the door of the sheep and, he, and that he that entereth not by the door, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And so the concept was that they had a sheep full and you had this encasement, whether or not it's a cave or whether or not it's a, a place where they build. But what does the shepherd do? The shepherd bring all the sheep in. And he brings them in, he makes sure everybody's in, he counts them and everything, and then he sleeps at the entrance. He becomes the door in order to get to the sheep. So he literally becomes the door. And so Jesus says, I am the door. He that entered not by the door, but climb it over another way, he's a thief and a robber. Very specific. <laughs> you all sit with me? <laughs> All right, we're going to get <laughs> Milton. Pray for me, Milton. Pray for me, Milton. <laughs> Say, 1 Timothy 2 5 tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is it? The man, Christ Jesus. We didn't set this, Christians only follow it. God set it. What did God say when Jesus was baptized and when he was coming out of the water? Remember what God said? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. I mean, this is him. So we didn't set the standard. So we're not selfish and egotistical. We're just repeating what God said. And there's only one way. And I think in our age of tolerance, our age of so many different faiths, so many different denominations, so many different cults and religions, it's very hard for people to conceive that we can stand up and say, there is only one way to God. And then they'll probably nail you to a cross. Oh yeah, <laughs> discrimination or being bigots. And it's, you know, it's difficult. But Christ is the only way to salvation. The way is narrow. There are no alternatives. You must enter by an act of the will and an act of faith. You have to enter on God's terms through God's prescribed gate. Christ is the gate. He's the only way. Holy God has the right to determine the basis. Sorry, that should have been only God has the right to determine the basis of salvation. And he has determined that it is through Jesus Christ alone. So if you want to get to God, God is says it's through this person. Not through Mary, not through Allah, not through Buddha, through Jesus. And he said that. Now you can pretend and say, okay, I can just believe what I want to believe and I can be, believe in whoever I want to believe in. Well, that's good for you, but when you get to the, when you enter into the wide gate, where is that leading to? Destruction. So you must enter the narrow gate alone. <laughs> All right. 
The fact is implied in the text, the word narrow in verses 13 to 14 gives the idea that the gate is very narrow. And how narrow is it? This is what some writers say. In fact, some Bible commentators say that the best contemporary expression of it would be a, would, would to think of a turnstile. A person who has to go through a turnstile alone. Any of you have been to a turnstile? Let me read on. The passageway through a turnstile is very narrow. Its metal arms don't allow more than one person through at a time. Zoos, train stations, airports have turnstiles. If a group of people are in a hurry to go in or out, they can't go through together. They have to go through what? One at a time. And that's the way it is with the narrow gate. People don't come into the kingdom of Christ in groups. You've got to come by yourself. The Jewish people thought that they were, all the, they, they were on the road to heaven be, together because of their Abrahamic heritage and circumcision. There are some people who were, are sure that they would go to heaven because they think their whole church will go to heaven together. Listen, don't rely upon abundant life. Don't say all of us in abundant life we gain together. I'm glad, I'm glad we all end up there, but each one has to go what? Alone. The decision is yours alone. Okay? <laughs> Say, um, but groups can't go through the turnstile in heaven. People have to go through on an individual basis. Salvation is individual. People have never been saved in pairs. Sometimes one person's belief will influence another person to believe, but salvation is still exclusive and personal. That's why parents, you believe. Your wife or your husband believe. And your children have to believe alone. And your grandkids have to believe alone. You need to influence them to help them to make that decision. But they got to do it alone. The question is that the Anglicans today, the Anglicans teach otherwise. They still hold the position. Yeah. Confirmation? Baptism of the baby. Right. Right. So, horses mouth. <laughs> from the, from the, and, I, and I think it is, I actually went to uh, a, a Methodist church, and they do the sprinkling as well, the baby, the baby. And then they use terminology. They use words like, this child now is baptized into the church. And I said, that's a very, that's a very serious thing. You know, that's your hope. But then at the age of 12, they confirm you. Um, but again, that child cannot be saved by their parents. The child has to be saved alone. It's a personal faith, very narrow. Mm-hmm. Correct. But Ron, how do you convince your children or grandchildren to believe? It's the only, you know, like you said, remember we, I don't know if it was last week or the week before, remember what Paul said to the church at Ephesus when he was leaving? He said, I commend you to the word of God and to the grace of God. You can live in, in their view. You can talk of it through your words. You can help them see it from the word of God, but you cannot save them. God has to save them. And hopefully they'll see your influence and they will want to follow and believe in Jesus Christ. But each one, I have grandkids now. 
They're young. And what is your prayer? What, what is your prayer for? What is my prayer for? Prayer for my grandkids now is that they believe in faith in Christ. Because I cannot save them. And I can't do nothing to help them to get saved. That's something that God will have through his grace. But you expose them to the word. You expose them to a life that you live. And hopefully through that, God will actually give them that. And bring them to church. They need to be under the hearing of the word of God. Because what does God do? A lot of churches have left preaching alone. But if you read, for, was it first? Is it 1 Corinthians or Romans? It Paul says, God is pleased with the foolishness of the cross. Preach the word. The church is responsible to preach the word so that people can hear the truth and respond through the help of the spirit. But if we don't preach the word, then the church is also held responsible for that. So how do we get them to the narrow gate? Commend them to the word of God, live a life consistent in front of them, and hopefully persuade them. Like Paul would say, I persuade you. So it's, it's a tough job, brother Ron. It ain't gonna happen. But let's read on. He says, it's very difficult to enter the narrow gate. And I know that shocks some people because we always hear that it's easy to, be, easy to become saved. Some say all that you have to do is just believe, sign a card on the dotted line, walk the aisles, raise your hand, and go to the prayer room. The problem is when people think they, they become saved by doing these things, they ain't on the right road because they go through the narrow gate because they didn't go through the narrow gate. It's very difficult to become saved. And I know I was a part of that as well. I was part of the counseling experience in our church. And you would have if a person comes forward, you would go behind them and you would take them into the prayer room and you would pray with them and you would read scripture with them. And then you try to do follow up. But therefore, the follow-up becomes of not because these people, they had an emotional moment and it was an emotional high and then they leave and that's it. Whether or not they believe or not. And so the person who makes that decision to follow Christ has to make the decision for Christ alone. The last part of Matthew seven fourteen has this to say about the narrow gate and the narrow way. It says, few... There be that find it. Now, abundant life. <laughs> Those who are watching as well on, on, on Zoom. These are the words of our Lord. He says, two gates, the narrow and the broad. Then he says at the end of that, there are few and many. Few go the narrow way and many go the broad way. How much is a few? <laughs> What's the percentage? Out of a hundred, what's the percentage that goes the broad way? And what's the few that goes the narrow way? Now Jesus in his own teaching, he realizes there's only a few. That implies that people aren't even going to know about the narrow way unless they're looking for it. And this is where I can help you a little bit better Ron. God said to one, an Old Testament prophet, ye shall seek me. And shall find me when you what? Search for me with what? All your heart. Nobody ever slipped or fell into the kingdom of God. Say, oh, oops, I just got in there by mistake. No. You have to make a deliberate choice. Okay? Let's look at Luke 13, 22 to 24. It says, and this is talking about Jesus. And he went through the cities and the villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. Then one said to him, Lord, are there few who are saved? That's the question. And he said to them, and these are words, and I think this is where we got to grapple with this because we, you know, there's different views on this. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. This is the Lord Jesus. He's saying to the Lord, so only a few who are saved. And the Lord says, strive. And what does the word strive mean? It really means to agonize. It's used in 1 Corinthians 9.25 to speak of an athlete agonizing to win a victory. The concept is spoken of in Colossians 4.12 with the words laboring fervently. And in 1 Timothy 6.12 with the word fight. Can you imagine putting those words in there? says, 
agonize through the narrow gate. Boy, that's, I know, we wouldn't read that in that, well, I don't know what version you'll read that in. Then the one says, laboring fervently to enter through the narrow gate. Or what about this one? Fight to enter the narrow gate. In other words, the Lord said that going through the narrow gate is agonizing. It demands fervent striving. He continues in Luke 13, 24 says, For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. I think um, there ought to be a time when we can really break that down in terms of explaining that. Because he's talking about striving. Normally what we hear is what? Believe. Come forward. Walk, walk the aisle, go into the room, sign a paper, stuff like that. But Jesus is saying he wants you to think through your sin and repent of your sin. So, okay, let's go on. <laughs> you don't become a Christian just because you walk an aisle. You don't become saved in a cheap and easy way. And Matthew eleven twelve says, The kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. It is those who earnestly strive to enter the kingdom that gets in. In Luke 16, 16, the Lord said, The kingdom of God is preached, and every man press it into it. That is not what we hear today, but that's what Jesus taught. Remember when I used the phrase, easy believism? Because you could get to the point where it's just easy to believe. Oh, but Jesus' words are very, very piercing. The kingdom is for those who seek it with all their hearts. It is for those who agonize to enter it. Their hearts need to be shattered over their sinfulness. The kingdom is for those who mourn in meekness, hunger and thirst for righteousness, and long for God to change their lives. It's not for people who come down along in a cheap way and want Jesus without altering, altering, altering their lifestyle. And this is one of the things. They want Jesus, but they don't want to change their lifestyle. And we've seen it. We've seen it. We've seen people who want to come to the Lord, but they want to continue to live the way they want to live. But we, we have the reminder about what the scripture, if any man be in what? Christ. He's a what? New creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become what? New. And I'm, hopefully, I'm hoping that I'm not reading that out of context. <laughs> right? So... We can't sleep our way into the kingdom. We have to make an earnest endeavor and display untiring energy. One of Satan's persuasive lies in the world today is that it's easy to become a Christian, but it's not. You have to go through the narrow gate by yourself, agonizing over your sinfulness. You have to be broken in spirit. Someone might say that sounds like the religion of human achievement you, walk, you talked about earlier, but he says no. Is when you come into the, with a broken spirit and recognize that you, you cannot answer on your own, that Christ pours into you the grace upon, grace upon grace to strengthen you to enter the narrow gate. In your brokenness, his power becomes your resource. And so that's for us because we would think, and some people, there has been an argument about this. There have been a whole debate about salvation, the issue of salvation, whether or not repentance is a form of work. You know, whether or not you can just believe and that everything is okay. But I think the words of Jesus are very, very strong and potent. But we don't want to just just, just throw Jesus' words out. But we let him speak. Because he is the way. And he's saying to us, this is how you get in. You know? All right. Y'all stay with me. Y'all worried yet? Uh, I, all I can say is, you know, if you leave tonight, you'll have to go and check the spirit to see whether or not you're of God. <laughs> you have a question? Okay, okay. All right, thanks. She's still with us. Okay. All right, you must enter the narrow gate unencumbered. Uh, have you ever noticed that you can't go through a turn, turnstile with luggage? It's impossible. The narrow gate is a gate of self-denial. It it does not admit superstars who want to carry all their garbage. You need to strip off self-righteousness and sin or you don't go through. 
You ever tried to carry one of them big knapsack trying to go through a turn sign? What do you have to do with it? You always have to either put it high on your shoulder or put it in front of you so when you get to the turn sign, you push through. Um, especially, we, we had that experience where we were in Chicago and we were going on the train and we were doing the train ride all through um, the city of Chicago. Man, everywhere you go, you come, when you come off the train and you go, you gotta go to a turnstile, you go, they let you down to go where you had to go. Now you get back on the train, you gotta go to a turnstile again. So what you have to do is if you wanna keep moving quickly to catch the train, what you have to do? Travel light. And if you get a knapsack, if you have anything on, try, put it on your, put it high up top. So when you move through, you just move through, nothing encumbering you. You're moving very quickly. So the rich young ruler in Matthew 19 came to the gate. He found Jesus and said, good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And that's a very important question. I think this young man was honest. He really wanted to know how to have eternal life. And the Lord went right to the heart of the problem and said, if thou will be perfect, go and sell what thou hast and give to the poor. Now Jesus hit the rich young ruler right where it hurt. He was trying to get through the narrow gate with the baggage of his riches. He also had the baggage of self-righteousness because he told the Lord earlier that he had kept all the commandments from his youth. The rich young ruler couldn't get through the narrow gate with his money and his self-righteousness. And in verse 22 says, he went away sorrowful. He wasn't willing to deny himself and agonize over his sin. He didn't strip himself of his luggage. He wanted to come through to the narrow gate, but he wanted to bring all that stuff with him. And Jesus said, no, when you come, get rid of it. And so he didn't, he walked away. But I think in that same story, uh, it said at the end of it, how, how, how did Jesus respond to him? I forgot the words. That, when, when the rich young little left, I think he responded. It said that he responded in a certain way. Well, no, not the one with the eye of the, the, eye, the camel to the eye of a needle. No, no, that's not the one. Oh, yeah, it was that. When the disciples asked, you know, he thought the rich people used to go into the kingdom. And then Jesus said, you know, it'd be easier for a camel to go to an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom. That's a very, you know, when you think about that, you can't bring your riches. Now, this one, riches was his baggage. That's not for everyone. I mean, you could be rich and that wouldn't be a baggage but you still have to come broken and contrite before God. There must be a gesturing of self. The Lord said in Matthew 18, three, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. What characteristics does a ch little child have? Utter dependency. That's what a little child do. When a little child, they look at you, they depend upon you, they trust you, they believe you. And he's saying you ought to have the same faith. Someone once wrote, and y'all will know this song, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Saving faith is not just an act of the mind. It involves stripping self in utter nakedness. It says, God be merciful to me, a what? Sinner. So we gotta come and we gotta come uncumbered. Now some people say, come to Jesus is so easy. Just believe and pray. There's nothing wrong with believing or praying, but those things do not bring true salvation when they occur in a vacuum. Becoming saved involves a difficult and radical admission that you are sinful and cannot commend yourself to God. So there is, there is if you believe, because it talks about believing unto salvation, there is a place for believing, there's a place for praying, you know, but there's also that time of commitment to the Lord. Then he says, you must enter the narrow gate repentantly, repentantly. You can't go through the narrow gate unless your heart is repented over sin. You must turn from sin to serve the living God. When John the Baptist was exhorting people to receive the Messiah, many people came to be baptized because they wanted to have their own sins cleansed. The Jewish people knew that preparing for the Messiah meant purging the heart of its sinfulness. And what did John preach when he came in, when he started preaching? He kept praying what? Repent. Repent, and what did Jesus do when he came preaching? Repent, repent. Charles Harden Spurgeon, a great 19th century English preacher said, you and your sins must separate or you and your God will never come together. 
no one sin may, may you keep, there must, be, uh, there must all be given up. They must be brought out like the Canaanite, Canaanite kings from the cave and be hanged up in the sun. You must turn from sin to God and there must be repentance in your heart. So when you come to the narrow gate, you have to come with repentance. The gate you must go through, though it is very narrow, it is in contrast to what? The wide gate. The wide gate. And I don't, he says, I don't need to say much about this. It's obvious by contrast. Everyone can go through the narrow gate together. If you want to go through the narrow gate, everybody goes together. You don't have to go through alone. It's wide. And then it says, there's nothing individualistic about it. There's no self-denial expected. You can bring all the baggage that you want, your immorality, lack of repentance, lack of commitment to Christ. The wide gate is the gate of self-indulgence. And there are many people who claim to be Christians who are totally self-indulgent. Pride, self-righteousness, self-indulgence, and all kinds of sins are welcome on the broad road. But if you have those things in your life, then you are not on an narrow road. It's because you can't get through the narrow gate with baggage. All right, let's talk about the two ways. We get in there, you know, almost there. Two ways. What are the two ways? And Matthew 13 mentions the broad way, and Matthew 14 mentions the hard or confined way or the narrow way. Remember this in Psalms 1, talks about them. He says, there, there is the way of the ungodly and the way of the ungodly. And in verse 6, if Psalms 1 tells us the results of the walking in the ungodly way. The choices are the same as they have always been. You can either go the way of the godly or the way of the ungodly. Now the broad way. Once you've come through the wide gate, it's easy living. There's plenty of rooms to stroll. This is the broad way. There are no rules, no morality is, no morality is particularly binding. There is room for diverse theology. And this is where um, we can begin to see a struggle here. Um, but you have some churches right now, today, in our time, where you would have gay ministers or gay priests. And then you would have gay people in your congregation or gay people in your choir. Now, gay people can be saved. You can be saved from that. But you don't live that life afterwards. But you can't have someone who is professing to be gay in a church. But if you look where our churches are, I think a lot of our churches are on the broad way. Because they're doing all kinds of stuff that is unbiblical. And they justify it for the reasons why they do what they do. Well, what I mean by that is, when we say to be careful, if you have a minister, how would you feel if one of, our, one of your pastors was gay, known to be gay, practicing gay? Would you sit under his ministry? Okay, that's what I mean. You have these people who are not trying to cover this up, not trying to repent of it, not even struggling with it, but just blatantly gay. So I think in that sense, that's a Broadway church. Yeah, but if, you have, but if you have someone who comes in and they're struggling with the sin and they hear a message and they repent of it and they were gay and then they want to turn from their gayness and they struggle with it, yeah, that person can come in. But even right now, if you come in and you have that gayish tendency, we will work with you. But 
you're not going to stand up on our pulpit and be gay. And say, hey guys, I'm gay. And I'm enjoying being gay. We don't tolerate that. Now, the Bible doesn't even tolerate that. The Bible calls that abomination. Now, right now when I'm talking to you, I'm very fearful. There's people who are online or people who record this stuff. When, when, when um, Ryan sends this out, they can label me as what? Hate speech. You got me? But if they're on the Broadway. Now, I only mention gay. Can you imagine those who are in adultery? And those who commit fornication? Sitting in the choir, on the pulpit, and we don't know. But then they are comfortable in their sin. I don't have a problem, sweetheart. But if you have someone who is struggling, I think it's the difference there. So what I mean by that is all kind, no morality is practically binding. So there's no room for diverse theology. There's, no, no, there's a tolerance of every conceivable sin just as long as you love Jesus or are religious. There's no boundaries. All the desires of the fallen heart are fed on that road. There's no need for the beatitude attitude or the study of the word of God. There's no need for internal moral standards. You can live with the mechanical kind of religiosity. There is no, there, that is no more than hypocrisy. The wide way doesn't require you to have character. You can be like a dead fish floating downstream. You let the current do the work. And Ephesians 2, 2 says, and he calls that road the course of this world. Proverbs 14, 12 sums up the tragedy of the Broadway. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end, therefore, are the ways of death. And so we have this Broadway, and it says the, w w the wide way has no standards except that those, except those made by men to fit their own comfortable systems. But Psalms one six says the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so you have people who are religious, they are moral, they don't commit any sin like that, but they may not believe in Jesus Christ and they do not follow Him. Now the narrow way. Verse 14 talks about the hard or narrow way. The best translation is a constricted way. It literally speaks of being confined to a narrow path on a premise, precip precipice, right? That's why in Ephesians 5, 15, Paul said, See then that you walk circumspectly. You must walk with your eyes open. The path is narrow and is hemmed on both sides by the chastening hand of God. The requirements are great, strict, and clear-cut. There's no room for any deviation from them. You must desire in your heart to fulfill those requirements, knowing that if you fail, God will chasten you, loving, lovingly forgive you, and set you on your feet. You say it is, it is hard, strict, and narrow way, then it might be something that, that I, I won't want. However, the wonderful thing about the narrow way, walking the narrow path, is that all the hardness of walking is borne by Christ himself. He said... My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But still be aware of what you are asking for if you decide to walk on the narrow way. Okay. There was silence in heaven for half an hour. Huh? Thank you. Now you got to count the costs. It's the narrow way, but you got to count the costs. Luke 14, 25, 26, we read, And there was a great multitude with him. And, turned, and he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. <laughs> Let me read that again. <laughs> Because that's the words, that's the word, the words coming from the Lord. Because people were following behind him. They were following him for various reasons. Some say they were following him because he could create food for multitudes. They were following him because he healed all the people that were around with diseases. He could speak to demons and they will come out. And so they followed him and they followed him. But then he just stopped. You know, they, somebody would say, but well, Jesus, if all, if all these people follow you, why don't they continue to follow you? Jesus was not that type of individual. He confronted them right where, they, where he wanted them to be. And that's when he turned and said to them, 
If any man come to me, and hate not his father, mother, wife, and children, brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life, he cannot be my disciple. So he challenges them on that. And then he continues his line of thought with these illustrations in Luke. He said in verse 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sit it not down first and count it the cost? In other words, you shouldn't start building something unless you're analyzing what it's going to cost you. You all agree? If you're going to go ahead and build a, a duplex, you want to make sure you know how much that can cost before you start building, right? So you can borrow the right amount of money because when you build certain points and then you can't finish, then people can start really kidding you saying, well, you ain't had enough money to finish it. So you got to sit and count the cost and see what it's going to cost to, to build it. That's what Jesus is saying. When you come to me, count the cost. Count the cost. Jesus, he also added, what king going to make war against another king? Sit it not down first and consult it whether he's able with 10,000 to meet that with coming against him with 20,000. And that's wise. He didn't get 10,000. The other guy get 20. He got to consider whether he should go to battle. Unless he get really strong 10,000 like David had. Now, David had some warriors alongside of him, but they, they would do anything for David. But if you don't have that, Negotiate. Have a peace settlement. That's like Ukraine and Russia right now. Who has the biggest army? And then in verse 32, he says, So likewise, whosoever, whosoever he is of you that forsaketh not all that he had cannot be my disciple. You have to consider the cost. Jesus drew a hard line. If you're not willing to say no to everything and to walk that narrow path, then you can't become a disciple of Christ. If you do walk the narrow walk, remember that it is God who enables you to do so. You can't walk the narrow path by yourself, but God gives you the grace upon grace and his strength will pour through your weakness so that you can make it. If you're willing to live the way he wants you to live, then you're coming, you're coming to him the right way. But remember that you will be persecuted, persecuted and face tribulation. Jesus told his disciples that time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that they're doing God service. And you know, that happened during a lot of our church history. A lot of people were burned at the stake because the people who burned them at the stake thought that they were doing God's work. And the people that they burned, you know, were doing God's work. You're going to spend your time running from those who want to persecute you. The narrow way can't be walked upon with bare feet. It's not a Luxious, luscious metal. The road is hard. Jesus never presented Christianity as a soft option for the weak hearted. You declare war on hell when you go through the narrow gate. And hell fights hard. And you must live your life with a beatitude attitude. You must constantly deal with your pride and selfish desires. Jesus said to Peter, follow me by the way and that will cost you your life. That's what the narrow way is like. It's hard, it's pressed, it's confined. If you wander off the path, God will chasten you. You say, but it sounds so hard. No, it's not hard because Jesus shoulders the burden for you. Church has a lot to talk about what Jesus said. Now there's two destinations and two crowds and we'll just end. Two destinations, according to Matthew 7, the broad way leaded to destruction and the narrow way leaded unto life. Moses, Joshua, Jeremiah, and Elijah all spoke of the way of life and the way of death. Psalms 1 says that the, ungodly, the godly are blessed and the ungodly shall perish. The word destruction in Matthew 13 refers to the ultimate eternal judgment in hell. The Lord says that everyone ends up in one of two places. All of the religion of the world will end up in the same place, destruction. It's easy to go the path that leads that way. You can take all you want with you. There are no standards, but when you reach the end of that path, things get rough. And there are no restrictions and plenty of people along the way, but it ends in hell. It's the Broadway. Jordan Bunyan said that the entrance of hell is from the portals of heaven. What a shock some people are going to get when they realize that they're going to hell. On the other hand, an hour way is going to open up into eternal bliss. The broad, world, the broad way narrows down into a terrible pit, and the narrow way opens up in the fullness of an everlasting fellowship with joy with God that we can't even imagine. The choice is yours. 
Consider the destination of the way you choose. You will spend eternity there now. How will man choose? The question is answered by the final point, and then he mentions two crowds. Matthew 13 says, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be who go in that way. And verse 14 says, hard is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. And that's amazing. Most people are on the road of human achievement. Most people are on the wrong road. People often ask me, that's this order, why, which, do you, which do you think will have more people, heaven or hell? And Jesus gave the answer in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. In the Old Testament, there was always a, believing, a remnant of believing people. And you'll see that throughout the history of the Old Testament, even with Elijah, when you had all these other prophets, so they were probably um, Israelites who were prophets of Baal. You had the king Ahab, Jezebel, who were Israelites, but they were also not of God. And you had the nation. And then when Elijah ended up at the brook, and then he started talking about, you know, uh, it's only me left. And what did the Lord say? I have what? How many? I think it was 7,000. I have 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. So he had a remnant. And so he, there's a remnant of people. The one time in redemptive history that will be unique is the tribulation. According to Revelation 7, there will be an innumerable multitude of Gentiles redeemed out of every nation, language, and people. And there will also be redeemed people from the nation of Israel, according to Romans 11, 4, I mean 11, 26. There will be a massive response to the gospel during the tribulation. Many people will respond to Christ. But for this age, the response of Christ is small because men would rather hold on to their own sin. Jesus said that men love their darkness. And so what are who are the few? Few compared to many. Few compared to many. The little crowd on the narrow way. In Luke 12, 32, Jesus looked at his disciples and said, fear not, little flock. <laughs> the word little is in the Greek word micron. We get the word micro from it, which means something small. The same word is used in Matthew 13, 32, of the mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds. There's always been only a few people who seek the way to heaven with all their hearts. There are very few people who agonize over their inability to enter heaven and willing to count the cost of walking the narrow way. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now the large crowd on the Broadway, it's easy to choose the Broadway. You just go with the crowd. You can try to add Jesus to your life, feel religious and go to church. You can join a system of religion that says it points to heaven and never deny yourself. Either way, you will end up in disaster. Jesus says many will be on that broad road. And look at what Matthew 7, 22 and 23 says, and we all know these verses. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name did done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that he that worketh or work iniquity. What a shock. The many people on the broad road are going to find out they were not on the road to heaven. The door will be shut in their faces forever. That's a sobering thought, eh? And that's where Jesus ended up with his Sermon on the Mount. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. And we didn't come up with that idea. God did. We ought to be grateful to God that we have the opportunity to respond, right? And we can be a part of the what? The few. And we can pray for the many. Because we realize that they could be on the road to destruction and not even be aware of it. The way to heaven is Jesus himself. Amen? So sobering. 
You should end on a high note by singing a song or something. But anyhow, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, these are very sobering words. And I know that even in Christendom, there are...